Shawnee, thank you for that introduction and for representing your sisters and brothers, the IBW. One of the reasons I'm standing here is because of the IBW, not a joke. They uh, endorsed me early on, and uh, along with, uh, quite frankly, every other union in America, and we came along. I made a promise, and I'm keeping it. I'd be the most pro-union president in American history, and I'm going to make sure that happens. Simple reason for that. You know, the middle class built this country, and unions built the middle class. We used to say in the Senate, excuse the point of personal privilege, though I'd like to introduce some of my family and friends. And I don't know where they are right now, but my, uh, you know, I, I, I married a, a beautiful woman from Skin Atlas Lake, was at Syracuse. I met her on spring break and fell head over heels in love with her and uh, gave up a starting job on the football team in Delaware to come up uh, uh, every weekend because I couldn't stay away from her. And, uh, and her, her brother, Michael, is here. Where, 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 where's the family? There they are, back there. But the Hunter family. The Hunter family is here. Daughter Morin and Greg and the children, Gillian and Gregory and Nancy Hunter and her daughter, Jess, my brother-in-law, Johnny's wife and daughter. And uh, as well as one of Bo's best buddies, uh, Andy Grote, and an old friend who's here. I excuse this again, as used to say in the Senate, a point of personal privilege. But uh, just like coming home, man, coming home. Molly and her brother, Jimmy Cream. And the president of Syracuse University and the dean of the law school, who uh, probably I wouldn't get in these days, although I went there on a scholarship. And, uh, and Mayor Walsh, Ben, thank you, County Executive McMahon. Uh, it's, it's good, you know, it's good to be in a place that means so, so much to me, and that means so much to our country with the project we're here to celebrate today. Governor Hochul, thank you for the passport into the state. Appreciate it very, very much. You've been a great partner to me and a great leader for the state, and you saw an opportunity to attract a more semiconductor supply chain businesses, and you, and you signed a law to make New York even more welcoming. We were down in Poughkeepsie not long ago, uh, a little outfit called IBM, spending $20 billion investing in, in, uh, in incredible jobs, attracting companies, creating jobs. A century ago, this region was the heartland of manufacturing. And when I was up here as a law student, you had Kodak, Corning, General Electric. Governors always believed it could be that way again. She thought that would be the case, and the region is poised to lead the world in advanced manufacturing. Not a joke. Poised to lead the world. And I also want to thank my buddy Chuck Schumer, Senate Majority Leader. This guy gets things done. And a close to a hometown girl, a senator from upstate New York, Kristen Chilibrand. She gets things done. I learned a long time ago, when Kristen calls and asks something, just, get, just say yes. <laughs> just, just do it right away, because you're going to do that anyway. So, good being with you, kid. And look, it's a hell of a delegation. I think it's one of the best delegations in the country, and Chuck is a great majority leader. <laughs> Getting big things done. And we wouldn't be here today. It's not hyperbole. We wouldn't be here today without him. And Kristen's, as I said, hometown here in upstate New York. She's a fighter for families in this area. And you'll be hearing from all these folks in a minute. But Congressman John uh, Katko, where, where's John? Johnny? Stand up. John is a Republican. And I like him a lot. I like him a lot. John, when I have been in the Congress for a long time, and we used to have that's, this is how we used to be. We used to work together like you've worked together with me and with the delegation. Thank you very much. I'm quite frankly a little sorry you're leaving. And uh, thanks for what you've done. And thanks for the passport into your district. I appreciate it. And thanks for reaching across the aisle to support the Chips and Science Act which this guy wrote right here. We'll talk about that in a minute. You know, and we also have one of the leading members of the United States Congress, Chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff. He came all the way from California just to see Chuck. Where, 
Where is he? There he is. Good to see you, Adam. Adam and I talk together a lot. We can't share any secrets to the rest of you, but, you know, we can, we can talk. He's the only guy I can talk to. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Folks, uh, we're here to celebrate one of the most significant investments in American history. Again, not hyperbole. One of the most significant investments in American history. And it's going to ensure that the future is made in America. One of the bright spots around the country. It should give us a sense of optimism and hope about who we are as a nation. And it's part of a broader story about an economy we're building, and one that works for everyone. The positions America put America in a, win, a position to win the economic competition of the 21st century. And again, that's not an exaggeration. It's literally an accurate statement. We're joined today by the CEO of Micron to celebrate their commitment to invest $100 billion over the next 20 years here in America to build factories to make semiconductors or small little computer chips that power everything in our everyday lives, from our smartphones to our automobiles to washing machines, hospital equipment, you name it. It's the largest American investment of its kind ever, ever, ever in our history. Thank you very much, Paul. They're going to build factories the size of — this is not hyperbole — the size of 40 football fields, big enough to fit the carrier dome four times inside it and still have space left over. And we're going to — this is amazing. What's that going to happen here? You guys have no idea yet. It's going to run — and it's going to run entirely on renewable energy. 9,000 jobs from PhDs and engineers. HVAC technicians, machine operators, with an average salary of $100,000 a year, and tens of thousands more jobs across the supply chain. 20 unions working together to fill jobs for technicians, construction workers, electricians, operating engineers. And by the way, it's the largest investment in American history that's also governed by a project labor agreement. That's a fancy way of saying union. Union, not labor, union. They ensure that the major projects are handled by well-trained, well-prepared contractors, subcontractors, and highly skilled workers. These agreements make the construction a top-notch project because they're the best folks to do it. Their projects are on time, on task, and on budget. Back in February, I signed an executive order to make sure large federal construction projects use project labor agreements. And it means that Micron is using one here as well. Micron's also playing, paying the prevailing wage for funding apprenticeships programs so folks can get trained in places like this community college for one of the thousands of good-paying jobs in this new site. And it really matters. It matters a lot. America invested in these chips. Federal in the federal investment helped reduce their costs, creating a market and an entire industry that's American-led. You know, that's how it all started. Over, as a result, over 30 years ago, America had more than 30 percent of the global chip production, 30 percent. Then something happened. American manufacturing, the backbone of our economy, got hollowed out. Companies moved jobs overseas from the industrial Midwest as well as from the Northeast and manufacturing towns like here in central New York and upstate New York. And as a result, Today, we're down to producing only about 10 percent of the world's chips. We invented them, but only we produce only 10 percent, despite leading the world in research and design of new chip, te new chip technology as well. It's here in the United States. But because of the new law I signed and Chuck designed and delivered, we're turning things way around, around in a very big way. When, with Micron's $100 billion investment alone, we're going to increase America's share of global memory chips and production by 500 percent. The company Intel in Ohio and other companies, including foreign companies, that are investing billions of dollars, billions of dollars across America to make these chips here. 
and it matters to you all, no matter where you live. It matters a great deal. Making these chips in America is going to help lower the cost for families looking to buy a car to replace your washing machine, get a new cell phone. It also helps companies outcompete the rest of the world. And I've got heard from Xi Jinping that he's a little concerned about that. <laughs> no, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. It's not, as I told him, it's not about conflicts, it's about competition. And we're back in the game. We're competing again in a big way. <laughs> Think about it this way. IBM needs these chips to build the fastest quantum computers ever built in the world in Poughkeepsie, New York. Instead of relying on chips made overseas that could be delayed because of a pandemic or some other global supply chain issue, they can get their chips in a few hours, in a few hours. It's a game changer. You know, where is it written? Where is it written that the United States of America can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? Think about this. No, I, I, I mean it sincerely. Where in the hell is it written that says we cannot be, as we've been hearing for the last 25 years, the manufacturing capital of the world? This country lost over 180,000 manufacturing jobs under the last guy that had this job. We've created 700,000 manufacturing jobs on my watch, adding manufacturing jobs at a faster rate than in 40 years. The previous president made a string of broken promises in places like Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, where promised investments in jobs and manufacturing never materialized, but layoffs and shuttered factories did materialize. On my watch, we've kept our commitments. On my watch, made in America just a, just, isn't just a slogan, it's a reality, made in America. And today's announcement is the latest example of my economic plan at work. I've said from the beginning that my objective is to build an economy from the bottom up, bottom up and the middle out, an economy that rewards work, not just wealth, an economy that works for everyone. So the poor have a ladder up, the middle class can do better, and when that happens, the wealthy do very well. They don't get hurt at all. They do very well. It's a fundamental shift, and it's working compared to what the very conservative Republicans are offering these days. Let's just take a look at the facts. When I took office, the economy was in ruins. My predecessor was the first president since Herbert Hoover, not a joke, to lose jobs in the entirety of his administration, the first. Unemployment, when I was sworn in, was at 6.4 percent. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses had closed. The irony is that during the pandemic, the record number of Americans became, at the same time we lost all these small companies, the record number of Americans became billionaires in the middle of this crisis, while more than 9 million people were still out of work from the pandemic when I took office. Today, with the help of the people behind me, we're in a much better place. 10 million jobs created since we took office, a record for any administration in American history. Unemployment is at 3.5 percent, the lowest it's been in 50 years. 5.4 million Americans applied to start small businesses, the highest level ever in American history. And because of the actions we've taken, gas prices are declining. We're down $1.25 since the peak at this summer, and they've been falling for the last three weeks as well, as well, and adding up real savings for families. Today, the most common price of gas in America is $3.39, down from over $5 when I took office. We need to keep making that progress by having energy companies bring down the cost of a gallon of gas that reflects the cost they're paying for a barrel of oil. There used to be a direct correlation. Barrel of oil goes down, the price of the pump goes down at the same time. If we're taking average profits they've been making over the last 20 years instead of historic profits they're making today, the price of gas would be down an additional 40 percent to 40 cents today to $3 a gallon. And by the way, last quarter, the five largest oil companies made in the last quarter $70 billion in profit in 90 days. Shell announced just this morning that it made $9.5 billion in profits in the third quarter. $9.5 billion. 
That's more than twice of what they made in the third quarter of last year. And they raised their dividends as well, so the profits are going back to their shareholders instead of going to the pump and lower the prices. Because if they charge the, the same amount as they, were, as they were acting as they did a year ago and two years ago, when the price of gas goes down, the price of oil, the price of oil goes down, the price of gas goes down. And even though my Republican friends in Congress seem to be hoping for a recession, many of them, present company excluded, Today, the GDP results came out, and the economy, in fact, is growing. In fact, the economy grew at 2.6% rate last quarter. And although it may not feel like for everyone, people's incomes went up last quarter more than inflation went up. And enough growth. <laughs> so economic growth is up. The price of inflation is down. Real incomes are, on going, are up, and the price of gas is down. Folks, continue to spend but now a more stable pace than during our rapid recovery last year. Businesses continue to invest in America. Exports are up, which means we're making things here in America and shipping the products overseas instead of shipping jobs overseas and sending them back here. The supply chains are running more smoothly, helping companies build up inventories. Here's another thing. My predecessor promised, and you heard it for four years, infrastructure week seemingly every week for four years, but it never got done. It became a punchline when you talk about Infrastructure Week. Well, on my watch, we turned Infrastructure Week into the decade of infrastructure and a headline. A once-in-a-generation investment on our nation's roads, highways, bridges, railroads, ports, airports, water systems, high-speed internet. And the American people are seeing the benefits of this economy that works for them. Families have more net worth today than they did before the pandemic. Fewer families are behind in their mortgages, their credit card bills, than they were before the pandemic. More Americans health insurance, more Americans have health insurance than before the pandemic. And we're doing everything we can to give folks just a little bit, and my dad would say, just a little bit of breathing room. We're giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices. Folks, we've been trying this for as long as I was in the Congress. We pay the highest price for prescription drugs of anywhere in the world. And I'm talking the exact same prescription made by the exact same drug company, sold in the United States and sold in France. You can buy it probably 30% cheaper in France or Canada, around the world. Where's it written that that's okay? Where does it say that's okay to do? We're capping seniors' out-of-pocket prescriptions starting next year. Prescription drugs, and it's the law now, will not have to pay if they're on Medicare more than $2,000 a year for the prescriptions, no matter how much they cost. Even if their drug costs are ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a year, like some cancer drugs do cost. <coughs> now, if Big Pharma tries to raise drug prices faster than inflation, they're going to have to write a check to Medicare to cover the difference because there's no rationale for it. Unless they can prove they engage in additional research to improve the product, if it's the same exact product, they cannot raise the price beyond the cost of inflation for that particular drug. And by the way, put this in perspective, last year the price of 1,200 specific prescription drugs went up faster than inflation. We're going to put a stop to that. From now on, if drug companies rise the price faster than inflation, they're going to have to rebate the money back to Medicare. We're also capping the cost of insulin for seniors on Medicare at $35 per prescription instead of the average $400 a month. <laughs> like some are paying now. We pass tax credits to help families buy energy-efficient appliances, put solar panels on their homes, help them buy an electric vehicle, weatherize their home. Things that are going to save, it's estimated by the utility companies, an average of $500 a year for the families, and much more if they were to purchase a vehicle. Yesterday, we announced steps my administration is taking to get rid of unfair hidden fees, known as junk fees, that are, that are proliferating like surprise banking overdraft fees, an average of $35 for every overdraft. 
or credit card late fees, an average of $50. Or if you get in a plane and you want your two-year-old child to sit next to you, you're going to find out you paid a hell of a lot more for your ticket when you land, before you land. If you find yourself in a position and it goes on and on and on, all these hidden fees, well, guess what? These can add up and make taking the real money out of the pockets of ordinary Americans. That's on top of actions we took earlier this month to lower the cost of hearing aids, to make them available over the counter at places like Walgreens and Walmart. This is going to save, on average, $3,000 for a pair of hearing aids for millions of Americans with hearing loss. $3,000. I took action to ease the burden of student debt for millions of working and middle class families. Average, average income, $70,000 a family, recovering from the pandemic. My friends on the right, Republic, they, they cr criticized the move. But I'm never going to apologize for helping working and middle class families as they recover from the pandemic. Especially, not to those same folks who voted for a $2 trillion tax cut before I got in office to give away that mainly benefited wealthy Americans and the biggest corporations. Not a penny of it paid for. We're doing all this by reducing the deficit at the same time. I don't want to hear about big spending Democrats creating a deficit. Let me give you the facts. The very deficit reduction that my Republicans voted against when they opposed the Inflation Reduction Act. This year, this year, the deficit under our leadership, is falling by $1.4 trillion. Let me say it again. This year alone, the deficit is down $1.4 trillion. In my first year in office, the deficit fell one year, one year by $350 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, the largest ever one-year cut in American history on the deficit cut the deficit in half. As I said, this follows a historic drop of $350 billion last year. And we're going to reduce the deficit by another $250 billion over the de next decade. Why? A big part of that is because corporations are finally going to have to pay something. 15% minimum tax. You know, in 2000, <laughs> in the year 2000, 55 corporations made $40 billion. God love them, as my mother would say but they paid zero in federal tax. Zero in federal tax. So guess what? The Inflation Reduction Act, we made sure they have to pay a minimum of 15%. That's less than you guys pay as union members in your tax. That's less than school teachers, firefighters, cops pay. But that 15% increase in the, the minimum tax is going to make sure we're in good shape for a long time here. That's all in stark contrast to Kevin McCarthy's Republican leader of the House of Representatives and his fellow MAGA Republicans who say their number one priority is to do the following. And they've said it publicly. By the way, if I had asked you, and we were just walking down the street, you said, can you tell me what the Republican platform is? What they're for? I'm, I'm not joking. I'm being deadly earnest. Like I said, I've been around a long time in public life. Republicans usually always have platforms. Say, this is what we're for. Well, they can't tell you what they're for, but they'll make sure they'll tell you what they're against. They're going to give the power we just gave to Medicare to lower drug prices back to Big Pharma to raise prices instead. The cap on the $2,000 cap on prescription drugs for seniors, gone, if they, Kevin has his way, McCarthy. $35 a month cap on insulin for diabetes for seniors, gone. Savings on health care premiums, $800 a year for literally millions of Americans under the Affordable Care Act, gone. And of course, they're still determined to repeal the Affordable Care Act overall, which would mean that tens of millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions who can't otherwise get insurance will lose even that insurance because they have a pre-existing condition. These protections are gone as well if the Republicans get their way, if Kevin gets his way in the Republican Congress. Tax credits to lower energy bills, gone. Corporate minimum tax, gone. Under the Republican plan, some big corporations are going to go back to paying zero again. That's the plan. I would argue it's reckless and irresponsible and it will make inflation worse if they succeed. 
And then they're coming after Social Security. Now, it sounds like, you know, what's, there's Biden, that's typical Democrats saying Republicans are after Social Security. This is the one thing they've said out loud. <laughs> they've written it down on pieces of paper. Senator Rick Scott, the Republican from Florida, who's in charge of getting Republicans elected to the Senate, has a plan that's laid out. You can look it up. You can, as my used to say, you can Google it. The plan that Congress will give, it will give Congress a chance to cut Social Security and Medicare every five years. Every five years, it's going to be up in the ballot. Either gets voted on or gets lost. Every five years. It's no longer, there's no such thing as a permanent plan. Every five years, you've been paying your Social Security since you were 16 years old on your first paycheck. Senator Ron Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin, he thinks that's taken too long. He wants it done every year. Every year, Social Security and Medicare are on the chopping block, every single year. And now they put forward a real ticking time bomb for the country. You're going to hear a lot more about it. The Republican leadership in the Congress has said, they made it clear, that if they don't get their way, if I don't vote to shut down, if I, excuse me, if I don't vote to re reduce Social Security and Medicare, if I don't support that, they're going to shut down the government, refuse to pay America's bills for the first time in American history, to put America in default. Again, read this. That's what they're saying. Unless we yield to the demands to cut Social Security and Medicare, they're determined to cut Social Security and Medicare, and they're willing to take down the economy over it. There is nothing, nothing that would create more chaos or do more damage to the American economy than that happening, if it were to happen. Let me close with this. It's been a rough few years for a lot of people I grew up with, hardworking Americans. For a lot of families, things are still tough. But there's some bright spots out there where America is reasserting itself. I've asked CEOs, including Micron and CEOs of many other countries, the following question when I spoke to the Business Roundtable, spoke to the Chamber of Commerce, National Chamber of Commerce. When the United States government decides to invest considerable resources in a new industry, that we need to build up for our national security and economic well-being. Does that encourage or discourage companies from getting in the game? The overwhelming answer is it encourages them to get in the game. Federal investment attracts private sector investment, particularly in those things we need badly. Our national security depends, depends on us having access to the most modern computer chips in the world. It depends on it. One of the things I've been able to do, and I make no bones about it, because of what Russia's activities, we have curtailed their ability to access some of this stuff. And guess what? They're not able to rebuild those devastating weapon systems to take out those civilians in Ukraine as well. Not a joke. It makes a big difference. These things matter. They matter a great deal. And it creates jobs and it creates industries. It demonstrates we're all in this together. And that's what today's all about. I've never, and I mean this sincerely, I've never been more optimistic in my life about America's future. I mean it sincerely. <laughs> Not because I'm president, but because we have entrepreneurs and people who know what they're doing to lead us to in an old and in a completely different era in terms of the kinds of technologies we need, like this man right here. Because I look out at the younger generation. It's the best educated generation, the least prejudiced, the most engaged, and the most least self-serving generation in American history. Look, I hope you feel, I hope you feel what I feel standing here today, pride. Pride in what we can do when we do it together to build a better America, providing our proving it to everyone, to proving to the world that our best days are ahead of us. I know every major world leader because of the nature of my job, and before that, when I was vice president, that was my job, and before that, I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And guess what? There's not a single nation in the world of major nation that wouldn't trade places with the President of the United States in a heartbeat. Not a, no, not a joke. Think about it. Not a single solitary one. Not a single one. 
And I talk to these folks all the time and meet with them all the time. And they want to know, are we going to be okay? Because if we're doing well, they think they got a shot to do well too. And I, that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. But we just have to keep it going. And I know we can. We just have to remember, for God's sake, who we are. We are the United States of America. There is nothing. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. And we're the only nation in the world that has come out of every crisis better than when we went into the crisis. And folks, we're going to do it again. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. And I want to invite my good friend, the great partner, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, to the podium, author of the Chips and Science Act, and one of the major reasons we're standing here. Chuck, the podium is yours. Thank you, Mr. Great job. Well, what a great speech. Does that show what the America we stand for is? Absolutely. Thank you, President Biden. And it's my distinct honor to welcome you back home to Syracuse. Your history in CUSE is no secret, dating back to SU days many years ago. But today, your legacy here is secured forever. Let me thank my true partner throughout this process, another SU alumni, and that is Governor Hochul. We make an unstoppable team, and if I didn't have her fighting alongside me for New York, we wouldn't be here celebrating today. I also want to thank your great county executive, Ryan McMahon. Where's Ryan? who through his leadership and vision made, the white, made White Pine the nation's premier green field for semiconductor manufacturing. The county executive, Center State CEO Rob Simpson, Building Trades President Greg Lancet, and a round of applause again for Shawnee Davis. as well as countless other local leaders helped transform central New York into a place that makes this investment possible. And of course, my dear friend, who I've come to know and become very close with, Sanjay Marotra, who built one of America's most innovative companies and is now following through on his vision of bringing leading edge semiconductor manufacturing back to America including right here in central New York. In short, folks, this is a great day. A great day for central New York and a great day for America. This is our future and it is great. <laughs> if there's a word to describe this moment, it's transformational. Transformational. Transformational can describe now what is happening here in Syracuse, in upstate New York, and in America. This is the largest private investment in New York history, the largest private investment in the nation right here, right here in central New York. 50,000 New York jobs, enough to fill every seat in the JMA Dome where Cuse is going to beat Notre Dame this week. <laughs> and every inch, every single inch of this massive project will be built with union labor.
When I wrote this bill, I told the CEOs, yeah, we want to help you. Yeah, we want to bring you back. Yeah, we don't want those plants going to China or Germany or anywhere else, but we're not going to do it unless we do it all with union labor, plain and simple. So getting this done has been a passion of mine, yes. I feel so fervently, so strongly about it. It's why I worked so long, so hard, so persistently for the last three years to author and pass the bipartisan Chips and Science Bill and bring Micron to central New York. To the innovators, to the job creators, to the workers that witnessed the slow erosion of semiconductors, we will bring these jobs back to our shore and finally, once and for all, end our dependence on foreign-made chips. <laughs> now, all of the major microchip companies are considering investing in the U.S. because of these federal incentives. Without the Chips and Science Bill, this celebration of new investment would be happening somewhere but they would all be overseas, in Europe or Asia, not here in America, not here in central New York. Congressional negotiations were all but dead over the summer. But President Biden and I knew the stakes were too high for the country to let the bill fail. And we fought so hard because President Biden and I knew what succeeding would mean to places like upstate New York. So with the President, by my side, supporting us in every way at every juncture. And with White Pine as my guiding light, we got the bill passed, which brought us here today. And President Biden, you will be going to many more great celebrations like this from one end of America to the other because of what you did. And the bottom line is, as the President outlined, there's a real difference between the two parties, folks. This was a bipartisan bill. I give my Republican colleagues, Congressman Katko and others, credit for joining us. But make no mistake about it, it was only because there was a Democratic majority in the Senate, in the House, and a Democratic President. If McConnell was leader, this bill never would have seen the light of day and we would not be here today. We're seeing investments like this across the country. And as I said, it will revitalize not only Syracuse, not only upstate New York, but Ohio, Georgia, Arizona, so many more places. And our children, our grandchildren, will benefit long term from the investments Micron is making in the community with jobs, with the future that every parent dreams of for their children. A $500 million community investment fund and hiring and contracting commitments that will ensure these good paying jobs go to the people, veterans, minorities, women, rural residents, and neighborhoods that need the most of all. So all of central New York, not just some, but all, will benefit. That's how the bill was written. That's how the plan was written. It will give people of all ages, of all walks of life, from the dad looking to upgrade his career in manufacturing to the little girl who dreams of being an engineer, it will give them all the education, the training, the support they need to build a life here in the community they grew up in and love. Just think of what this means. <clears throat> The chips that power nearly every aspect of our daily lives, our economy, our national security will be made in America by upstate New Yorkers. So yes, in conclusion, my friends, Syracuse has always been part of President Biden's history. But now, thanks to the President's leadership, Mr. President, you have changed Syracuse's history forever. So this is a great day for upstate New York, a great day for America. Thank you for celebrating the future here today with us. God bless you. God bless America.
Now I'd like to invite Governor Hochul to the podium because, you know, there was two pieces of this. There was an important piece of legislation passed in the United States Congress. But there was also an important piece of legislation initiated by the governor to make this finally happen. Governor, the podium is yours. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Thank you. Good morning, Central New York. No, it's afternoon, isn't it? Just see if you're awake. I know some of you have been here since this morning, and I appreciate your patience. I'll just catch in the, see if you're paying attention, paying attention here. It is so fabulous to be here. I have waited for this day for so long, and I'm so grateful to have extraordinary partners, people in the private sector, labor community, and in government. And that does start with our very own, once a resident of Syracuse, New York, when he was a student at the law school, our president, President Joe Biden. I want to thank him for coming to town, not for a law school reunion, but a reunion of upstate with the glorious past of its manufacturing legacy. That's what the reunion is going on right here today. And then we've waited our lives for this. We have waited such a long time to finally have that sense of hope again, and it happened again. And I want to thank the president and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. If he had not been the Majority Leader, we would not be sitting here today, I guarantee that. We needed the Democrats to get this over the finish line. And I do thank Senator Gillibrand and all the other senators who teamed up on this. And in New York State, knowing how important this was to our state, I thank the entire Democratic congressional delegation and the two Republicans, John Katko, and Chris Jacobs of Buffalo for being the two who supported it. I'm grateful. I'm grateful you stood up. I'm grateful at least you stood up. And Sanjay Marotra, I cannot believe the relationship that we've had just over this last year. Our shared values and how we can work together, the private sector and government, saying we can work together to just build and energize a community that had been forgotten for so long. I know you're doing this because you want to continue to be the world's greatest manufacturer of semiconductor chips, and you will be, and you're going to do it here. But what you have done to my community, to my state, is something I will go to my grave grateful for because you transformed a state that for a while had given up believing in itself. So Sanjay, to you and all your partners at Micron, everybody from Micron, we love you. We're so grateful you're here. You have been extraordinary. Since Micron, Micron, stand up, Micron, Micron. How do you spell hope in New York? It's M-I-C-R-O-N. That's how you spell hope, M-I-C-R-O-N. We are grateful to you. And I remember my first weeks as governor, just a little over a year ago, Kevin Eunice came to me, and I want to thank him personally, because this was a the job, <laughs> Empire State Development. He said, we have an opportunity. There's these guys from Idaho, a company. They're going to look around the country for an opportunity to expand. And I said, how big is this? It's the biggest deal in American's history. I said, really? Sounds a little big, Kevin. But I said, bring him into my office. Let's see what this is all about. So we had a meeting. We had a chance to talk about what I knew about upstate, because I'm from upstate. I happen to be the first upstate governor in 100 years. I know upstate New York. And I lived through the tough years. I knew what it was like when unemployment was 15 percent, when all the members of my big Irish Catholic family, who grew up in an area called Lackawanna in Buffalo. And all, yeah, Buffalo, here we go. The bills are doing pretty good, too. <laughs> Grandpa made steel. My dad made steel. My uncles made steel. But in 1982, when all those jobs went away, my brothers and sisters couldn't find work. Unemployment was 15 percent where I came from. And it was all over upstate New York. We lost those jobs to Japan and China, the Southwest. The phrase in our, my community was, last one out the door, turn out the lights. That's what we told our kids. Our greatest export were our children. I lived through that. That's in my soul. I know what happened to a state and to a community because the businesses gave up on us. 
We didn't give up on them. We were still the same people. We still wanted the dignity of a good job. We wanted our union members to continue working and making things like they had for generations, but the jobs were gone back then. So when I saw an opportunity with Micron knocking on the door saying, what can you offer? I said, we're not losing this one. This is just too big. This is how we can regain that sense of exceptionalism that we've always had as New Yorkers. It's who we are. We build things, we grow things, we imagine things. And I knew we couldn't let this one go. And we worked hard. And I'm so grateful to have partnered with Chuck Schumer through every inch of this to get it done at the federal level. But once it was done at the federal level, that meant there'd be incentives for companies to come back from other countries, build the industry here in the United States. But what would lead them to New York? Because everybody's saying, oh, it's not the place you want to build a business. Oh, no, they're not so friendly. I said, we're going to prove them wrong. And what we had to do, we went to the legislature. And I thank El Sturpey, our assemblyman, for being the quarterback who got this one into the end zone with the legislature. I thank Jeremy Cooney. I thank Majority Leader Andre Stewart-Cousins. I thank the Speaker Carl Heasey and everybody who stood up and said, we can do this. Now, there were some naysayers. Oh, no, what are you doing here? Not sure about this one. I said, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not losing this one. This is not happening under my watch. And we got through with the support of the legislature, the Green Chips Act, that gave us that extra leverage to say, I go back to Sanjay, I go back to Micron, I said, yes, you're going to do something in America, but you can do it in New York. And we're going to give you the best educated workforce, the most incredibly innovative people from all the walks of life up here, the people who are being educated in world-class universities. And I know that working together, our Green Chips Bill, which puts an emphasis on sustainability, you're going to be a model for every other business in the world when you're done. And we're focused on the $500 million community investment plan that you've made, because we asked for it, and I'm thank you. We said we can build up childcare so moms can get to jobs. We can do apprenticeship training. We can get kids in underserved communities that chance of an opportunity that they never would have had that their parents didn't have. That's how we build the New York dream, and it's happening before our eyes. That is what is so energizing. So those who gave up on this state a long time ago, oh, you didn't make the bet in the right place, because it's happening here. I'm getting phone calls right now from companies all over this country who are saying, tell me about New York. Tell me about this whole ecosystem. We don't need to be a Silicon Valley or a triangle down in North Carolina. This is not just Chip's corridor. This is Chip's country. This is New York State, and we're going to build it here in New York. And I am so excited to be able to turn back, turn the page on history that was dark and hard for many of us for so long. This is a new era, my friends. This is a new day. This is New York. Thank you very much. As you all can tell, one thing we lack from this delegation is enthusiasm. I want to introduce uh, Senator Gillibrand now to the, bring her to the podium, but I want to make one comment that doesn't, may not seem totally consistent with what we're doing. One of the reasons why women in America have an opportunity to serve in any capacity they have, including in the military, why we have department heads of entire United States Coast Guard and others is because of this woman right here. So, Kristen, you're, it's all yours. Thank you, Thank you. Well, this it, this is an extraordinary day for celebration. I can't tell you how important this is for the state and the country. And it starts with a president who believes in the American worker who believes in the American union movement, and who believes in the endless possibility of what America can build and what America can do. And that is President Joe Biden. Thank you, Mr. President, for having the vision to bring us here today. The second person we need to celebrate is our own Senator Chuck Schumer. He brought this to life from the beginning. This was his idea. He's been working on this legislation for over a decade. He knew 
that to compete with China, we needed to make it here. He knew if this country was going to be secure, we needed to make chips here. He knew that the only way to do this was through a bipartisan bill that would bring the whole country together about making it here. It was Chuck's dream vision from the beginning, something he knew he would do when he became majority leader. So I just want to thank Senator Schumer for not only being our vision, but our closer. Thank you, Senator Schumer, for getting it across the finish line. And then I have to thank our governor. This doesn't happen without a governor who is able to come to the table with resources, to come to the table with promises of the best workforce in the country, who can come to the table with promises for education, for a pipeline of the best students, of the best workers. Someone who could come to the table with tax incentives, meeting this company, Micron, halfway to get it done. Governor, without your vision and your commitment, this would also not be done. So thank you to Governor Hochul. And last but not least, our CEO. Sanjay's had a vision for what Micron can do. I can't tell you how proud he was to show the president what this plant's going to look like, that it's football field after football field in length, the state of the art. It was amazing. It was more than a kid in a candy shop. It was a man who was realizing his vision of his whole future. And he sees each one of you in this future, every worker in this community is part of this future. And it is a bright future, and you should be so proud. Thank you so much. Now, there are three reasons why this is a big deal. And I won't use the word that the president likes, but it's a big deal. And it's a big deal for three reasons. The biggest and most important, especially for this community, is jobs. This is going to create tens of thousands of jobs over decades. This is not a small investment. This is a generational investment. And not just this generation, but the next three. This is extraordinary for what it will do for Central and Upstate New York. It is extraordinary. And as the governor said, more companies will come. They will want to be part of this ecosystem. They will want to be part of this energy. They will want to be part of this success. The second reason this matters so much is national security. I sit on the Intelligence Committee and I sit on the Armed Services Committee. And when the Republicans did not want to fund this entire bill, several of us went to the SCIF to tell them, if you do not fund this now, we will not compete with China and we will not be able to keep this country safe. They understood and they got it done because of Senator Schumer's leadership. So this is the most important component to keep this country safe. Do not underestimate how important it is to be at the forefront of semiconductors, of AI, of quantum and supercomputing. And this technology allows for all of that. Without it, we do not keep our country safe. And the last reason why this is so exciting is that it's hope. It's hope for the future. It's hope for tomorrow. It's for every kid sitting in the audience or watching this on television saying, I could be an engineer. I could be a mathematician. I can work at Micron. I can work anywhere. I can be the future of this country, the leader and the builder to see made in America once again right here in upstate New York. You're going to hear from our last and most important participant up here on this stage. But, you know, the point that I want you all to remember is the jobs created making these chips and building these buildings is important. But guess what? Those of you who sell automobiles and dealerships are going to sell a whole hell of a lot more cars because people have good salaries. Those of you who make sandwiches in restaurants are going to make a whole lot more meals. Those of you who have clothing stores. I'm not joking. Think about the spinoff. Think about the spinoff. And so this is, this is really a game changer for New York. It's a game changer for the country. And the guy who's changing the game, Sinjay, it's all yours, kid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for that introduction. Mr. President, I can tell you
that as an immigrant and as representing 48,000 team members of Micron, this is really a humbling and a profound honor. We wouldn't be here today, Mr. President, without your vision and leadership on the CHIPS Act. You championed this so hard, not just for national security, not just for economic security, but what it means for the communities, for the workers who will make the world's most advanced memory chips. The people of Clay and this region can take pride that what they make here will be used all over the world. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership and for making this moment possible. And today we are celebrating the largest semiconductor manufacturing investment ever announced in the United States, an investment right here in the heart of New York. We, Micron, plan to invest $100 billion over the next two decades, building a megafab manufacturing complex employing 50,000 workers here in New York. When fully, built, when fully built, these fabs will produce nearly 4 billion chips a year. And each of those chips I had it here, and it, is it? Can you see it? It is very little, but I happen to have I happen to have another one in my pocket. It's this small. It is smaller than my thumbnail. It is thinner than my thumbnail, and it will contain. These chips that we'll make here, each one of them, will contain billions of bits of information. Isn't that astounding? <laughs> the fabs that we built right here in Clay will be critical part of Micron's global manufacturing network, creating leading-edge memory chips to be used in most demanding electronic applications worldwide, everywhere. Clay, New York, just a few miles north of here, will be able to say with pride that they are home to some of the most advanced manufacturing in the world. So why is memory so important? The semiconductors that we build, the memory chips, handle the information that makes modern computing so valuable. The data required for computing lives in the kind of chips that Micron makes. And the examples are all around us. The ability to change speech to text in your smartphones, advanced safety features in your modern cars, massive e-commerce platforms driving digital transformation, precise medical imaging systems that help doctors make critical diagnoses, all of these applications, and myriads more depend on fast, accurate data. And because memory makes access to data easy, it is at the heart of all of these technology applications today. Memory is also an essential component of critical infrastructure, including aerospace applications like next generation radars, avionics, secure communications, and electronic defense systems. So I hope you understand why memory is so important. Memory really matters. Advanced computing systems require continual innovation in memory, and Micron teams lead the way. Micron, over 44-year history of the company, has now amassed more than 50,000 patents. We are an innovation powerhouse. We are the clear technology leader in memory, and we are now bringing that leadership in technology and manufacturing excellence to right here in Clay, New York. And the importance of memory is also underscored by the sheer size of the market. 
The total market for memory is expected to grow to more than $300 billion by the end of this decade. So it is obvious to meet the growing demand for memory, new fabs need to be built. But not long ago, an investment of the scale that we have talked about today in the United States was not obvious at all. In fact, it was not even realistic. Over the last 30 years, foreign countries have incentivized businesses to transfer semiconductor manufacturing overseas. Without similar public, private, government partnership here in the States, costs to build in the US versus overseas grew to as much as 45% higher. US sites were simply unable to compete effectively against these overseas incentives. But now, what we are doing, what many thought impossible just a few years ago with the CHIPS Act totally changes that. Now with CHIPS Act, we'll make the US and New York specifically a hub for leading edge semiconductor manufacturing. This bill and what we are achieving because of it is reviving the belief that America can be a manufacturing leader. We are grateful to President Biden, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, and so many others who ensured chips became a reality. Senator Schumer, in particular, was a fierce advocate for CHIPS Act and for New York. Yeah. Senator, you were relentless, and that's why we are here today. But, equal, but equally important are the many state and community partners who made New York a great fit for Micron. I'm appreciative to Governor Hochul for her vision and drive to create an incentive package led by the team at Empire State Development that is helping level the playing field. Governor, you were visionary, creative, strategic, firm, and yet fair. You helped achieve, you were instrumental in achieving this partnership between Micron and New York. Thank you. And we also appreciate the hard work of so many here in the community who envision this future. Center State CEO Rob Simpson, County Executive Ryan McMahon, Mayor Walsh, Congressman John Kateko, OCC President Hilton, and Syracuse Chancellor Severud. Each of you have really been great partners and we look forward to working with you as we move ahead. And we know New York will stand alongside us to ensure a successful partnership because we share common goals. Goal one, meeting the economic and national security needs of the US. Goal two, securing long-term global semiconductor leadership for the US. Three, strengthening and expanding central New York as a regional semiconductor and innovation hub. And four, generating profits, benefits for a wide range of stakeholders in the community. In New York, our alignment on these goals and your strong support has been critical to making this the best site for our new mega fabs here in Clay. And we are really excited about, about becoming part of your community here. You heard earlier today of the wide range of trade and technical jobs required for this project and of Micron's partnership to invest in workforce development as well as in the community. We are proud to be partnering with New York to create a historic $500 million green chips community investment fund. And we look forward to seeing these investments put to work for the benefit of the community. And we are investing nationally too. The Micron Foundation is partnering with National Science Foundation in joint funds to develop semiconductor curriculum in colleges and universities all across the US. 
Of course, our partnership with New York would not be possible were it not for the leadership that Micron's tremendous global team of over 48,000 team members has delivered for the company. I'm really grateful to all our team members worldwide that do what they do every day for us, enabling our leadership today and our capability to launch this investment, this mega fab project here in Clay. In particular, <laughs> in particular, I want to thank the team that worked with the New York team. I want to thank Manish and April, Scott, Rob, Buddy, as well as Courtney and so many others in bringing us to this milestone today. I also want to thank Micron's exceptional board, who were an integral part of our final decision to select New York for this mega fab site. Lenny Hainsworth and Rich Beyer are here representing our board. I would now like to ask, I would now, now like to ask Rich, Lenny, and the Micron team to stand and please recognize this amazing team. Thank you, team. Thank you. Today is indeed a historic day. We are at the beginning of a transformational journey that will have an impact for generations to come. Transformational for Micron and our capabilities to create leading edge memory. Transformational for Central New York as together we build a world-class semiconductor hub. Transformational for the United States and the world driving a renaissance in advanced manufacturing, securing our future, and building technology solutions that truly will enrich life for all. Thank you. And now, thank you. And now it is my honor to invite President Biden to come back to the podium to make closing remarks. Very brief closing remarks. You're a very patient audience, but there's a lot to be excited about. It really is. We use the word all the time, transformational. But this is transformational. And it's not just here, but it's primarily here. And so I want to thank you all. This is a big day for Central New York, but it's also a big day for the United States. And uh, with the, as my grandfather would say, with the grace of God and the goodwill of the neighbors and a quick not rising, we're on our way. Thank you all so very much.